welcome to No Nonsense with Jay Michael. I'm Matt Newell, the Pacers editor for the Star. I'm here with Jay Michael. This uh, Pacer season uh, sort of officially opens tomorrow with Media Day. First practice is Saturday. Uh, it's great to have the Pacers back. Um, so we'll start with the question on everybody's mind, Jay Michael. Is Victor Oladipo the mass singer? <laughs> um, I would say yes, he's the mass mass singer. I never watched that show until the other night. Um, I thought it was kind of creepy uh, at first with this. I didn't get it. But, yeah, I think it's definitely Oladipo. Based on the clues they're giving, it seems like it's him. But, uh, you know. Yeah. A really important question to ask at Media Day. Tomorrow. Yeah, it's very – he's going to get that. And now, he was in town here in Indy last week, um, and he still has to come back. I don't, I don't think that Mass Singer stuff is live. I would so, assume not. Yeah, that's not live. So I don't, I don't think his schedule being here last week, leaving, and then having to come back has anything to do with that. <laughs> but, um, hey, he's going to have a little bit of time on his hands to have some fun, so I guess why not? Well, the podcast is, of course, called No Nonsense, and I open up with nonsense. But uh, we'll get to the real question. I mean, the the timetable for Oladipo coming back from his leg injury has obviously been December, January. Yeah. Have you heard anything different and just sort of what? where is he at from what you've heard? No, there's nothing different on that. I mean, I actually, the other day I saw uh, some stuff trending on Twitter about this is breaking news. Oladipo will not be ready for training camp. <laughs> like, yes, we've only known that for like six months. <laughs> I saw that as well. I thought that it's, was odd. It's, it's, you know, it's like, hey, we didn't know any that, that, if anything, what that shows is, hey, I did not pay attention to the Pacers all season. I know nothing about them. So this is news to me. Therefore, it should be news to you. That's something we've all known. It's not breaking news whatsoever. The only news would be if he obviously he comes back earlier, like, say, November or if he comes back later, that's the only thing. But he's not going to be ready to start the season. That's the only thing that's been consistent this whole time. And I have no indication that it's any different than that. What's your sense on where the Pacers will be at in terms of obviously um, without him to start? There's a there's a period in which he, they're going to have to adjust. He's going to have to adjust to being back. Um, and then, you know, ho- hopefully he, he is, or eventually he, they'll have to determine this is who he is as a player going forward. I, how does that factor into this season, or how does that uh, work for them? I mean, it factors in heavily because, you know, how he's going to be used. So let's say you have best-case scenario. Um, you know, your, your best free agents, Jeremy Lamb, Malcolm Brogdon, TJ, TJ Warren, who was required in a trade. Uh, if those guys pan out and they – you know, ten, they produce and they give you the offense that this team needs, which, it, you know, it lacked towards the end of last season. You know, even if that happens, you're still going to need Oladipo to be able to beat some of these better teams to be able to make the playoffs and actually be a threat to advance. And when Oladipo comes back, no matter how good he is when he comes back, it's still going to take time, not only of getting back in game shape, but, you know, I was told uh, by a couple of uh, people close to the situation about a month or two ago, that regardless of how this pans out, you know, they're going to do the load management thing with him. You know, so if you have, you know, three games in in four days or two games in three days or back-to-backs when Oladipo comes back, so he's not going to necessarily be playing every game. He's not going to be playing starters minutes every game. So early on, even if he comes back in that December to January window, I don't expect him to be Victor if he is able to be Victor again until we get closer to the All-Star break. Um, which is in February, second week of February, somewhere around there. So that's where I, that's why I don't think this team, no matter what happens early on, we really won't know who they are until you hit that back end of the season where everybody's trying to either make a push for the playoffs or trying to tank to the bottom. And so that's why I think there's so many question marks going in because there are a lot of variables in play aside from the new players. Sabonis playing a new position. It's Oladipo. How long it's going to take him to get back to full strength? And then how long it's going to take him to play starters minutes consistently again? And with that injury he has, there's really not much to go on. I was going to ask you, I mean, Tony Parker had the same injury. I think Parker was somewhat older than yeah. Victor. I think he also came back quicker, and I think I don't think there were any complications. But mm-hmm. is there any sense of what he, Victor's facing in terms of what kind of player he's going to be? It, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I've talked to folks about this as well, and it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to predict because, you know, not only did Parker have that later – you know, Parker is a different type of player than what Oladipo Very is. Very different, yes. Uh, I mean, the one thing that separated Victor from everybody else on his team is if you gave him the ball and he ran a pick and roll, he could destroy a defense. And you take Oladipo off the floor, 
last season, they couldn't do that. He's the only guy running a pick and roll who was a threat to kill the defense. And when you, you know, in meaning, if you look at how the Pacers perform with the ball handler, no matter who the ball handler was on the pick and roll or the roll man, the Pacers are poor. They're really not good at it. I mean, that's a staple of any offense, particularly in the NBA. Teams run pick and roll constantly. They're just not good at it. So in order to even be good at that, you need, um, last season at least, you needed Oladipo to be at full strength. At least now, Brogdon is good with the pick and roll. Jeremy Lamb was excellent as the pick and roll ball handle last year. So they have some options when he comes back that he doesn't necessarily have to be the guy to do it all the time in those situations. They have other options who are able to do it. But exactly, uh, you know, is he going to have that explosion? What, what separates Victor, when he comes off that screen, he all of a sudden creates this separation, either stepping back or just blasting to the rim with that explosion. And that's what kind of creates those opportunities where he's able to get dunks and open three-point shots. How long is it going to take him to get that? I think that's a huge thing for him because before he got injured last year, when he got injured for good, when he tore his knee on January 23rd or that quad muscle in his knee, um, I never thought he had that separation explosion. And I thought on his jump shot, especially didn't look crisp before he ended up going down. I, I always had this kind of, oh, he's okay. Oh, he's not okay. Oh, he's okay. And it kind of panned out when he ended up getting injured. So I think those sorts of things, um, you know, I think he's gonna, they're going to have him ease into it. I, I just don't think we're going to know the answer even when he comes back right away. Um, who's the guy? I mean, who do they give the ball to to get a basket when they need it while Victor's out? That's a tough – can I tell you I don't know at this point? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> It, that's a tough one because we don't know what Sabonis is going to look like at the four. Uh, I've been doing some film on him for the last month. Uh, if he's on the floor with Miles Turner, he doesn't look for his shot. Um, that's what killed them against Boston. I mean, a lot of things killed him against Boston. I'm not going to put it all on Domas. That's not fair. Uh, but if you look at him when he plays away from the basket, he always looks to pass and screen. He never looks at the rim. Uh, Miles Turner, um, is he going to, you know, he's better facing up. So if Domas isn't comfortable away from the rim and Miles isn't comfortable with his back to the rim, that, that kind of creates some, you know, so, some issues with matchups because you have a five who doesn't post well but prefers to face up, and you have a four in Sabonis who offensively prefers to play at five. Um, but, you know, I would imagine with both of them on, a, you know, they're going to cross match defensively and offensively. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm confident in either one of them right now that you can consistently go to them every game looking for a bucket. Um, Jeremy Lamb, really good pick-and-roll ball handler. He flourished last year with Charlotte. That was the best he has ever played as a pick-and-roll ball handler. He's a wing guy who wasn't used that much that way uh, in his career. And he was he was pretty doggone good. The only downside to it is when Lamb is the pick-and-roll ball handler, he creates for himself. He doesn't really create for others. So I think, you know, in, in, in Malcolm Brogdon, it's, it's, it's like one of those things where you have some good offensive weapons, but when it comes to playmaking for other people, how good are they going to be? I, I don't know. It's, I think it's so many new pieces. I don't know what the offense is going to look like. I, I don't know if I can bet my money on anybody. I would say now uh, Lamb would be the guy maybe if you're looking for a bucket late in the fourth quarter and you just want to give him the ball and, hey, just go boogie with it. Uh, but, I mean, that that's subject to change. I think there's just too many questions right now because I'm not even sure which configuration. Who are going to be the five guys you put on a court to end a game? Yeah. Um, are you going to play start Sabonis and Turner together but really play them apart, you know, like sub one of them out early? And maybe they're starters together, but they don't really play as much together as you think they are. Maybe that could happen. I think there's all sorts of possibilities that are on the table. Uh, you've got a story posted today, uh, today Thursday, on uh, the, the Sabonis and Turner Matt pairing in the front court. Everybody should go there and read that. Um, so let's delve a little bit more into that. Really interesting stuff. And you, you sort of get into the, the X's and O's of why or what Sabonis needs to do to mm -hmm. fill that role. Can it work? And then will it work? <laughs> I mean, it can. I think if it does work, it's going to take a while. I don't think it's going to work right out of the box 
right away. Um, it's gonna, and that's why I think early on there's gonna be some times where we're gonna be like, "Wow, this works," and then we're gonna see some games that's like, "No, this doesn't work." Then we're gonna say, "Oh, it works." And if you look at what they did last season with that matchup, as I, I say in the story, when they play against teams with other bigs, like when they went against Memphis, when Memphis had, now granted, Memphis wasn't a great team, but when Memphis had Marcus All before they traded him to Toronto, and they would play him with Jaron Jackson. Pacers did pretty well against that kind of, you know, that lineup because of the size. Uh, you put them in against, you know, a team, even Portland, which is a good, which is a good team that had a couple of bigs, um, but they would go small and they would put um, uh, Al Farouk Amino at the at the four spot and make Sabonis guard him. Actually, you could get away with that because Aminu is a catch and shoot guy. He's right. not a guy that's going to kill you off the dribble. He's not, you don't, there's not all of these different things you got to worry about. So you could get away with Sabonis playing the four against a guy like that with his limitations at the four. But when they went against teams that had, could go smaller and kind of mix those lineups up. And that's when the difficulty comes in. And, you know, Sabonis for, in particular, if you look at the Boston series, he did some really good things defensively in isolation. When he switched against Kyrie Irving in particular, he held his own. He did surprisingly well when I went back and looked at some of the film, staying in front of him, not getting beat, going to the rim. But there were plenty of instances where he was defending far away from the rim and he got smoked off the dribble by guys like Marcus Morris and Terry Rozier smaller guys quicker guys and that's the challenge for him being able to stay on the floor do, do you keep Sabonis on the floor with Miles Turner in those situations I, I don't know the early my early indication would be it's going to be a challenge early and I really believe in their heart of hearts the Pacers are just hoping that he's okay they don't expect him to be great even though offensively Sabonis has been really hesitant at the four when he plays away from the rim, they think he can, the offense part will come because he's a smart player. The toughest part is the defensive side of the ball. And that's going to tell the story. Um, if he can be okay, doesn't have to be spectacular. Uh, that's going to put a lot of stress though on Miles Turner as the big man protecting the rim because he's going to have to do a lot of stuff to help cover up some of those breakdowns if Sabo early on, I think, with Sabonis uh, trying to cover some of these smaller guys. So, you know, it's going to put a lot of stress on them defensively as a team. But the flip side, of course, is offensively you have more firepower. So maybe in the end you come out on a plus side, and that's what they're hoping long term. From uh, reading the story, it really seems like the people you talk to, Sabonis is a versatile guy and a very smart guy. So there does they seem to think he can figure this out. Yes, I mean, is do you, I mean, do you think he can figure it out? I think I think his I think the IQ is IQ. If you look at the way he plays, he's a really good passer. Um, look, they ideally, you know, I brought up in the article. I actually was asking about, you know, I brought up Al Horford to some of the people I, I talked to. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, because when I looked at Sabonis playing, I was like, you know, that's what he's what he was doing in that series against Boston is what you see Al Horford was doing. Everywhere, when he was in Atlanta, when he's in Boston, like, you know, they're kind of similar, not the fastest guys, but they're not terrible athletes. They're not the the biggest physically, uh, you know, even though both of them, you know, how Orford for most of his career has been a five, even though now he's in Philly, he'll be more at the four. He was a five in by definition, but he really played at the four a lot when he was in Atlanta. Um, when he was in at Boston, you saw him playing in that high post, in the pinch post, like the foul line extended, um, running the offense, creating the motion, setting the screens, dribble handoff, and hits occasional shots. You didn't see Al Horford taking six, seven threes in the game, but he'd take that occasional three that would break your back. And I think that's actually a good level. If, if Sabonis became uh, the Pacers version of Al Horford, that would be a huge success. That's a really good ball player. That's a huge success. And you'll take that. Uh, does he become that this season? No. Uh, could he develop into that? I think he could. I think the IQ is there for him to do it. I just don't see – what I didn't see last year from him was the confidence. And like I said – you know, the video that I've done a video breakdown where I'll show this, uh, you see repeatedly when he's in that position, uh, he doesn't look to the rim. He immediately looks to create 
or to hand off the ball to somebody else. And with Al Horford, he does the same thing. But if he Horford sees that you're sagging off of him by two feet and trying to clog the paint, he's going to take the shot and he's going to hit it and make you pay for it and make you come out. And then when you come out, he'll put the ball on the floor, beat you off the dribble, make the defense contract, and then he'll find somebody spotting up in the corner for three. And that's what Sabonis has to do. He has to make people convinced that he's looking for his offense and get his offense because when they realize that he's not looking at the rim at all when he's 16 to 20 feet away from the rim they're defending five versus your four because offensively he's taken himself out of the game and he's got to stop doing that it's uh, the thing that strikes me as odd is he shot better than 50 percent on threes last year it was 10 and 19 or i mean it was something it was not a big number Clearly, he can hit the shot. Yeah. Why doesn't he take it more? I, yeah, and you know, one of his uh, former uh, acquaintances at um, Gonzaga, who's now um, uh, with the Phoenix Suns, uh, Ricardo was uh, Ricardo. I think it's Foy. Foy. Am I am I mispronouncing his name? Is he the Foy or Foy? I think it's Ricardo Foy. Anyway, he's um, uh, he was at Gonzaga with 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 Domas and. You know, he's now in Phoenix and he's worked with him in off seasons previously. And he's like, it's just, you know, he wants to pass first. He wants to distribute. He wants to help other guys out. Uh, And it's just more of a mentality. It's not a physical. He clearly can shoot the ball. Right. Yeah. It was only 19 threes, but he clearly can shoot the ball. And there are times that you see him offensively, even, you know, my biggest complaint, you know, I'm always uh, complaining about how he's so left hand dominant and he'll pass up. He he'll take a tough shot with his left hand rather than an easy shot with his right hand by going or going to his right side. Right. Uh, and I just think that's a bad habit that he's gotten into as well. And he can, but the thing is, it's not that he can't shoot with his right hand or finish. He can. So it's, it's not that he doesn't have the skill set. It's, I just think it's just habit forming, um, and he's just got to be more conscious of it. And if defenses are going to give him a layup with his right hand, take the layup with your right hand rather than shooting a mid-range jump shot from the left side of the floor. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's that sort of thing. And I, I just think he hasn't been used to it. Um, and, um, you know, he can, you know, he, will he get 30 double-doubles this year? I, I don't know, like he did off the bench. Um, but I think offensively, he can be a little bit more versatile. He has that in his game. And uh, it it doesn't – it's about playing smart basketball. And sometimes smart basketball, it's not selfish for him to look for his own shot. And I think he just has to find that healthy balance. And there's some guys you want to say, hey, stop shooting. And I think he's the guy that you say, hey, look for your your stuff. Even if you end up not taking the shot – if you make the defense think you're going to take it and they know you can make it, it's going to create something for someone else because they're going to start helping on you. And it's going to make his other numbers go up by, by extension. The Pacers need to give him – he needs an extension if he's going to stick around. He's the last year of his contract. Um, just sort of where is that at? It seems like it's a no-brainer to give him an extension from the Pacers' standpoint, certainly. Yeah. Um, at the worst, you can trade him. <laughs> yeah, I, look, I expect uh, – from what I was told, I, I expect an extension to happen – you know, it's like Miles Turner uh, last year. You know, it's like anything else, like trades at the trade deadline. Everything tends to happen once you get up against the clock. They don't. They rarely happen early on in the process. That's kind of unusual. So I expect something to happen. Um, you know, the the only the only caveat, you know, is you know he's he wanted a starting role and they've committed to starting him. That's what he wanted coming into this. And, you know, obviously the question is the money. I would expect most if not all of the money to be guaranteed um and you know I, and this is a guesstimate i haven't been told this number you know i would guesstimate somewhere around 70 million would be a fair number um anything more than that miles turner's making about 80 million including incentives uh easily reached incentives so i think miles is technically 72 but the incentives make it pretty much an 80 million dollar contract uh so i I would slot his contract slightly below in value for Miles Turner. I think that's fair. Uh, now, if he wants more than that, equal to more than Miles, then you're getting into an issue, a situation where maybe it gets a little bit more complicated. Maybe a guy wants to go have his own team somewhere else or force his way out and makes crazy demands. I don't sense that that's it's a bonus, and I just think this will be a relatively easy decision to come to. But, you know, you know how things change once you get up against it. And when's the deadline? Uh, before the season starts, you have to have it done before the season, and it's usually what, what do they start? The twenty third, right? Yeah, I believe so. The twenty third. It has to be. I can't. Re- you, now you ask me. It's either right before the season, before the season starts, 
because that's what we did with Miles Turner last year. Yep. Um, and and I think in the past at times it's been October 31st, but um, I'm pretty sure this is before the season begins. And I would think, I mean, some people, when Turner signed his contract, everybody said, oh, my God, that's too much money. And then you look at what NBA players make, and you go, no, that was, that's a really good contract Every, for the for the every, Pacers. Everything is relative. Like, it's it's not about – if you ask most people, they think just about everybody who gets paid more than them is getting paid too much money. It doesn't right. matter what it is, right? So, yeah, it's relative to what other guys around the league are getting. It's about the marketplace. So you got to compare Turner's numbers – to comparable guys or guys in his class, and it's a it's a it's a great contract. And I would assume the same Sabonis at at seventy million for four years would probably be seen similar. I mean, to, I guess the point I'm making is whatever happens with Sabonis and Turner, the the worst case scenario is you have a trade asset, uh, right? If you're yeah, the Pacers. and it's and it's a, and those are tradable contracts, too. right? You know, like it's not so big like some of these two hundred million dollar deals you hear about. It makes guys unmovable. Um, so yeah, it's. You know, it's yeah. I, I expect something to come out now. The the caveat to all of this, of course, once the season starts, when you talk about moving assets, what does Goga look like? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, <laughs> and I think you know if he comes out of the box killing it, I mean, you either have three really good big guys, or depending on what your other deficiencies are, maybe you're willing to part with one to to fill those voids, and you're in a good position to do so. I, and and plus, Gogo would be on a rookie contract, so he's you know it's, it's at a lesser number. So um, maybe I mean that's why I'm saying like there's so many things that can happen and so many variables that we just un, that are unknown. This all can go a lot of different ways. And I don't think Kevin Pritchard's probably gotten enough credit. He's done this kind of thing where he's left. I mean, he had a bunch of guys on one year contracts left here. He's always had giving himself flexibility mm-hmm. with the roster. Um, and I think it's a credit to him that, he, I mean, fans want everything locked in. Yeah. He seems like he's okay. He trusts himself to make the right decisions when the time comes and have some flexibility with who he's got. Yeah, I think I think Kevin did an excellent job with this this, this offseason. I think he knocked it out of the park. Um, not only, you know, coming into the offseason, I said the Pacers are going to need to, and they're probably going to want to get younger, which they did. I don't think anybody's over 30 on this roster right That's now. That's correct, you're right. Um, oh, well, uh, Justin Sam, Holiday might be 30. He's I think 30. He, I he's think 30. He's the oldest, but nobody's, right? oh, yeah, but no nobody's over, over 30. 30. Yeah, you're right. Um, they, so they, they need to get younger. They've done that. They need more scoring. At least on paper, they've done that. Um, they need more versatility in terms of their players. Uh, not only in terms of going with smaller lineups, but just being able to come up with different combinations. And, of course, that's going to be on Coach Nate McMillan uh, to, make, to make some of this work. And they've done that. I mean, you got – Jeremy Lamb can play multiple positions. Brogdon can play two positions. T.J. Warren can play three or four in a small lineup. Um, you have a lot of guys. Uh, you know, you could play. You know, Sabonis under the rim. Uh, you could play Turner under the rim. Let's see how it goes. Maybe you can play them both together. Goga um, Bataze. I'm saying his name I, right. I, that's, yeah. that's how I've been yeah. saying it. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. doesn't Goga, make it right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've I've I've, I've said a lot of uh, tweeted a lot of things during this off season about what I hear about Goga and. Uh, you know, I was told his ability, his shooting ability is is fantastic facing up. And he's a guy who can defend. He's a, he's a, he's a shot blocker. Defensively, he's a five. And offensively, the thought is he can play facing up to the rim, probably a little bit similar. Maybe there could be some uh, redundancy with Miles Turner. I don't know. But that Goga has uh, some confidence. He's a young guy who's played against professionals uh, and has excelled. Um, and so you throw him into the mix. They have so many options on what they can do, and and Kevin Pritchard being able to do that, um, you know, I was told during the off season, uh, you know, the Spurs really wanted Goga, and to the point that you know R.C. Buford uh, has had gone to see him, like you know, almost ten times, maybe more than ten times, uh, in in kind of scouting him, and I think that's a good sign that the Spurs really valued a guy. Like Goga and I, the, the the Pacers pick right before them and getting him in the draft, um, so I think Pritchard was able to do some things. If you look at the contracts for some of these guys, and I know Brogdon's making about twenty one million. A lot of people think that's too much money, but you know Ricky Rubio got seventeen million a year from Phoenix. So relatively speaking, uh, to me, Brogdon's a light years better player than Ricky Rubio. Uh, you look at the number that he got Jeremy Lamb at. Uh, T.J. Warren. Not only did he get T.J. Warren at three years, 
I think, $30, $35 million left on his deal. But he also got a second-round pick uh, in the deal. So he gets T.J. Warren, and he gets a pick from Phoenix from taking his contract. So I think he did some good things and was able to flip some of those picks that he was able to get during the offseason. He flipped those picks basically uh, in the deal, a couple of those picks in the deal to get Brogdon. So I think he was really efficient in some of what he was able to do this it didn't look good for the Pacers early on in the offseason in terms of what they were going to be able to get. They knew they weren't going to be able to get any star players. I've been saying that since January. And so they had to force uh, they had to force the issue and get a guy like Brogdon. Because if you don't get Brogdon, you probably don't get Jeremy Lamb. Brogdon was a big piece reason of why Lamb came. So being able, looking like the cupboard's bare, pulling off that sign and trade from Brogdon, gets you Jeremy Lamb, not as this franchise in a lot better position. And they're on good contracts. I, I look at everything and I says, I can't say anybody, relatively speaking, is overpaid in NBA terms. I, I, maybe you see see differently, but I don't see any of these Timothy Mozgov sixty four million dollar deals <laughs> they don't have on their bad. roster, yeah. right? They don't have any Jan Mahimi sixty four million dollar deals on the roster. Um, you mentioned Gogo. Use that as a jumping point off to the bench. Um, I, I, it almost seems like Goga better be good if they're going to have any kind of bench. <laughs> yeah. You're talking, I mean, Edmund Sumner's, you know, maybe he's got some potential. He's fine. TJ McConnell's your third point guard. Aaron Holiday has some upside. Um, you know, Lamb starting until Old Depot gets back. Doug McDermott, I think, was actually okay last year. It seems like people were disappointed in him, but I think he was Doug McDermott. Uh, who knows what TJ Leaf is? Uh, you know, and then you've got Goga as well. That, yep. uh, just reading the names off here in my own head, that doesn't sound like a great bench. Where are they, what, what are your thoughts on where they're at with what they got coming off the bench? Yeah, I agree. There's a lot of question marks. That's why when you say, "Well, what does what does the what does the the, the, the five that you in the game with?" I'm not sure if the the five you in the game with is your starting five, and I'm not sure what your bench rotation outside of Aaron Holiday coming in to back up Brogdon, um, Goga coming in to back up one of the bigs. And after we get past that, um, is Sumner ready? I think he's close to being ready. Look, if they didn't think he was ready, they would not have torn up the final year of his deal and renegotiated a longer deal. They clearly believe uh, at 6'6", a guy that can play multiple spots, that he has a future here. Um, Is it going to take, you know, this may be, this will be the first year I anticipate where he will play consistent minutes uh, off the bench. Now, how many minutes are those going to be? I don't know. And and that's why I say it's going to take time because I think they have to figure out who's your next four or five guys off the bench and what that combination is going to be. Um, I don't know. And Goga, to me, yeah, Goga has to be has to be good. He has because he's pretty much taken the role of Sabonis as the first big off the bench. That you know, and Sabonis has been pretty doggone good. So that's that's big shoes to fill. Uh, based off everything I heard about him, and and mind you, when I say everything I've heard about him, I understand that a team, every team tells you every pick they made <laughs> is the pick they wanted, and Couldn't he's great. He fell to us. Yeah, I can't believe he felt it. He's great. When I say all of these things about Goga, it's not based on anything I've gotten from anyone with the Pacers. Absolutely no one. These are people around the league. Scout, he worked out at Tim Gerg's camp in, in Las Vegas this summer. The Pacers sent him there. Blue folks away. Um, so these are people who have no agenda. They're not trying to hype them up. It's just straight up, you know, in, in most cases, I'm talking to them on background where they said, look, this guy's really good. Other front office people who really coveted him as well really like him. And they haven't seen anything to this point that leads them to believe that he's not going to be good. The, 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 the lowest expectation that I was, I was told is that he'd be okay, that he'd be a, a rotation bench guy who would help you win some games. Not spectacular. I heard one person say that. Everyone else, and when I say everyone, I mean a lot of people are far above that on what they think he can be. A lot of them think he can be a starter in the league. Another interesting aspect of that to me, though, is – if he's if he's good, you know, let's, who knows how good? But if he's good, how do you fit him, Sabonis, and Turner together? Because that would seem to be another who's playing power forward in that. Yeah, it, when when if Sabonis and and Batadze are on the floor at the same time. Oh well, I think or if Turner and Batadze are on well, the floor at the same time. I think if you play Turner and Batadze, you play Turner. I would based on that. This is if projections are correct. I play Batadze at the rim and put 
and, and spread Turner <laughs> and have him as the guy. Um, and if you have Batazzi on the floor with Sabonis, I put Sabonis under the rim and put in Batazzi at the four. That's interesting. That that's that's, interesting. that's now that's a, that's an educated guess based on what I know about Batazzi up to this point. And obviously, what we end up seeing could be completely different because you know it's it's one thing. I'm cautious about projections because you know when when it when it's for real, you never know. Some guys rise with the pressure, and other guys crumble. And so, it looks like skill wise, he's there. But it seems like confidence-wise, he's there. But we, we really don't know until he's actually put into that pressure cooker. And he's still 19 years old. 19. <laughs> you never know. The hardest thing to judge with players is that 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 is judging them as people. And that's if we just judge strictly on talent, you know, Michael Beasley would be a perennial all-star based on talent. But you know, if you judge on you know what he is as a person and what he's become, what his mentality is. He's nowhere near close to that. So that's why you could have the skill set, but maybe you crumble when, when the bright lights are on. And so we still got to see that about Pataze. But, you know, like I said, he played professionally at one of the top leagues in the world, and he balled out. And so it's a good sign that at least he's performed on that level. All right, let's wrap up with a little speed round here. A couple quick ones for you. Just give me your quick thoughts. Uh, we touched a little bit on Malcolm Brogdon, but what are your thoughts on him? He's going to, you know, can he play point guard um, mm-hmm. without Oladipo, and how does he he and Oladipo fit together? Yeah, I think he could play point guard without Oladipo because he has Jeremy Lamb next to him. So I I, I, I anticipate there's going to be a lot of mixing and matching where you're going to see, you know, Brogdon running pick and roll and Jeremy Lamb running pick and roll and one one of the others off the ball spotting up as the shooter uh, and creating, you know, putting pressure and stress in the defense and, you know, maybe not necessarily creating something for themselves, but creating something on the other side of the floor because they can they can they can beat their man one on one and beat defenses. Uh, I, I think Brogdon's a very versatile guy. He do a little bit of everything. Um, he's a good enough defender. I got to see more of him defensively to, to to be more convinced of what he can be on that end. Um, but I, I think he's going to work fine uh, without without um, Oladipo to start. I'm not worried about that at all. I think the the issues that they're going to have as a team um, uh, coming into the season is just the newness of everything. I'm actually more curious about how Nate McMillan uses them. I think it's predicated more on that than if they're good enough because skill-wise, Brogdon, for me, is good enough to be a starter in this league and and can flourish here. Do uh, Do the Pacers have enough shooting? I think they have enough shooting. Uh, I think T.J. Warren is a guy who he blew up as a three-point shooter last year. Um, I think you need to have a spread guy at the four. And even though T.J. is projected right around a three, I'm curious how he's used if he plays at the four. I think with you got Jeremy Lamb, who's a, who's a decent shooter. I don't think he's a great shooter from three, but he's a good enough shooter. Brogdon's a good shooter from three. But, again, what makes them, to me, different than last year's team is that they, they can shoot the ball, but – if you don't if you don't close them out, they can shoot the ball and hit the shot. If you do close them out, they have the ability to beat their man off the dribble on the closeout and do things on the move. And that's something that this team has lacked. So I think they have some pretty good shooting. Uh off the bench, I think maybe is a bigger issue for the shooting than what the starting what we project to be the starting five. And last one for you, you obviously just touched on uh, Warren, TJ Warren, but he was the other one I wanted to ask you about. Can he play Defense well enough to play the three? Can he rebound well enough to play the four? <laughs> you know, he, he leaves a lot to be desired on the defensive side from what I've seen in Phoenix. Now, the, the, the caveat to that is Phoenix is a terrible team and organization. And, I, you know, he played for four coaches in five seasons. So I think that's part of it. Um, I think he'll be better here. Um, you know, TJ, you know, funny thing is I actually know a guy personally who played high school ball with him in Durham. The guy, um, uh, this one, this one guy who was a teammate. He and I were talking about him, and the reason why I know this guy is because his father and I went to college together. <laughs> and it's just by chance. He's like, you know, he's like, yeah, I was TJ was my teammate, and he's like, believe it or not, he's a Duke could shoot. And the guy that we saw last year in Phoenix, he said that guy offensively, that that's the real deal. That's the TJ we know. He's like, but he's a really withdrawn personality. He can kind of go into a shell a little bit. Uh, so he's not going to be the most vocal guy in the locker room, but he's not going to be a problem for anybody either. Uh, he, he, I think he's the type of guy who, 
if Nate McMillan, you know, gets on him about playing defense, that he'll play defense. That's the feeling that I've gotten from people who who are close to him and been around him. And you know, is he so? Is he a good enough shooter? Yes. Is he a good enough defensive player? We haven't seen that. But you know, like I said. If you look at that dumpster fire in Phoenix, <laughs> is there anybody there? Has anybody played in Phoenix in the last five years outside of maybe P.J. Tucker, you could say, plays good defense? And it's just not a well-run organization. I mean, obviously, they gave up T.J. at $35 million and a draft pick for the Pacers just to take him off their hands. So um, I think T.J. could be okay, but I, for me, the jury is still out on that side. I don't think we've seen him commit to play defense because he just hasn't been in an organization that has forced him to be more disciplined. And there's one thing that Nate McMillan was able to get out of Boyan Bogdanovich is help make him a credible defensive player. doesn't have to be great. just got to stay in front of your man and make an effort. I was going to say, Nate McMillan gets some criticism from fans for various things, but I don't think you can argue that he's taken guys who weren't known for playing defense and made them defensive players. Yeah, and you know, and the one thing, the biggest – so what I said, passing and distributing the ball – is an issue that I would see with this team, you know, something to look for going into the season. The other thing I would say is rebounding. Uh, that's been a problem for now a couple of years. Miles Turner isn't nearly the defensive rebounder that you need him to be on a night-in, night-out basis. Um, you know, Sabonis obviously is a good rebounder. But will T.J. Warren be better? I, that, that hasn't shown to be a strength of his. But even last, you know, the past couple seasons, my biggest criticism of Bogdanovich, Bogdanovich does not, did not throw himself in there to rebound nearly enough with that big physical body. And so that's an area that I think the Pacers got to be wary of, wary of is on the rebounding too, because that's been an issue in the past. You got these younger, you know, quicker twitch guys that can get you offense, but you got to be able to get the ball to get into your offense. So I think that's something for everybody to look forward to look to, to maybe see, you know, if they can be a good defensive rebounding team, I think that kind of covers up maybe a lot of, you know, other flaws that they have until Victor comes back. Yeah, if Sabonis can't play with Turner, I don't know where the rebounds are coming from. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Like you, you take Sabonis off the floor. I mean, I, is, is, is Batase a great rebounder? I, I, and I haven't been told that he's bad, but I don't know. Like, yeah, you pull Sabonis out of the mix, you, then – Without – I mean, Oladipo's – I mean, I guess Brogdon. May, I mean, how, who else is an above-average rebounder? Exactly, position? and I mean, that and I don't that know and that's that and one. that's my point. And so you could say, hey, we need to rebound, we need to rebound. But you look at, I mean, I, honestly, I've never really seen TJ uh, he's, he's, sacrifice himself to rebound. Um, and you know, I was I was joking with uh, Dan Burke, who's the assistant coach, who's kind of like the defensive coordinator for Pacers. I was joking him last year about I was looking at some film. I said, man, when is I said we were talking about Bogdanovich. I said. I was watching last night's game, and I say, like, Dan, I don't think he threw his nose in there one time, and the ball was gettable. And he's like, that's something that we talk about with him. And it's like, it's with some of these guys, it's just he's clearly big enough. He's strong and physical enough. Why can't you beat out a 6'1 guy for a rebound? And it's just it's habit forming and about mentality. And I don't know where you're going to get that outside of Sabonis, maybe Turner, but Turner hasn't yeah, shown, shown that no. consistent. Physically, he should be able to do it. But yeah, we haven't seen that. He's not terrible, but he's not. He's not terrible. He can he's be not good. <laughs> he can be. He can be better. He can be significantly better at doing it. And yeah, that's that's a that that's a that's a big thing. I don't know. And that can. I have a feeling if uh, if things go off the tracks early with the squad, that's going to be one of the things they're going to be hammering uh, is you know defensive rebounding and committing. All right, well, we'll end it right there. Please come to IndyStar.com. Subscribe. No one covers the Pacers. No one gives you more than IndyStar does. Um, and uh, check out the IndyStar for J. Michael's latest on Turner and Sabonis. Media Day is tomorrow. We'll be all over that and uh, throughout the rest of the season. Thank you for listening.